Welcome to the Clear the Shelf podcast with Chris and Chris, the show that meets at the intersection of education and entertainment to discuss online arbitrage, retail arbitrage, wholesale, and all facets of selling on Amazon. We'll bring you news, tactics, strategies, insights, stories, and interviews to help you grow your Amazon business. And now, here are your hosts, Chris Grant and Chris Rasick. What's going on, Amazon sellers, and welcome back to the Clear the Shelf podcast with myself and my blithesome co-host, Chris Rasick. Today, we've got a duo of guests, Steve and Alexa French. Uh, They've built a $3 million plus retail arbitrage business, and that's not cumulative. That is uh, annual, so it's uh, they are they are experts in the field. Uh, And Chris and I have been on a bit of a kick of wholesale. And so it's, it's kind of nice to kind of, uh, get back to our roots, uh, of what many may think of as traditional arbitrage. Uh, Steve and Alexa share tons of information across Instagram. Uh, that's what Alexa does. Uh, and Steve shares a ton of information over on Twitter. Uh, and we hope to kind of dive deeper on today's episode. Our intent with, uh, with this one is to kind of help you gather some insights into what it's taken for Alexa and Steve to build such a large business in a model that I would argue people say is unscalable. Uh, and I would say that they say that incorrectly. Uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, Alexa, Steve, welcome to the show. I appreciate you guys, uh, taking some time away from the kids and your business to, to hang out with us. Thanks Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Now, before we dive in, you guys know the drill. Uh, this show is not free. Uh, we may not hide the show behind a paywall, but that doesn't mean that you guys get it for absolutely nothing. If you guys find some value in this episode, do us a solid. Give us the equivalent of a digital handshake uh, by hitting the follow button on your favorite podcast player where you're listening to this or over on YouTube. Hit the like button for us. Uh, not only does uh, it help us, but seeing the pod rise in the charts gives us a bit of a dopamine hit and uh, it makes us want to come back and do this all over again. So uh, let's go ahead and and let's get rolling here. Um, I always like to set the table a little bit uh, as we get into these podcasts. So I'm curious, what got you guys started on Amazon? And can we kind of hear a background about what, uh, what made that happen? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll take this one because I, I was the one who started us. Um, but it was early 2020. Um, so like January, February of 2020. And I was, we were like trying to pay off debt, you know, kind of like doing the Dave Ramsey thing. Um, and so we were just, I was looking for side hustles. I was just returning from my second maternity leave back to my regular job. And that like broke me. Like I did not want to go back to like, a standard nine to five, no flexibility. And so like I was desperate. I would, I was basically willing to try anything. And, um, so I'm in like, you know, a bunch of Facebook groups and on YouTube and you're looking for everything and, uh, selling on Amazon came up. Um, and it seemed like something that I could try kind of without telling him, like it wouldn't take a lot of money. It didn't need to take a lot of time at first. Like I could just kind of like tiptoe in and see kind of what happened. Um, and so that's what I did. We, I opened the account officially in February of 2020 um, and then, you know, started shopping. He did. I did tell him pretty quickly because we can't keep any secrets from each other at all. Um, and he was excited about it, too. So he kind of got on board. But um, yeah, so that was what got us started. And that was like literally weeks before the COVID shutdowns happened. Mm -hmm. Well, then when that happened, I was working in the schools. I went home, you know, full time. His job actually shut down because he was in the travel industry. So we were kind of in this like perfect storm to be able to like try this and and see what happens. Interesting. That's a, so, I mean, that was kind of a perfect storm because it was, uh, I mean, while the pandemic was, you know, was bad and, and, you know, it hated what it, what it did and people had to be locked down. Uh, that was a good time to get into this business. You know, it was, uh, I, it was very reminiscent of, you know, 10 years ago where literally anything on the shelves you could make money on. Uh, and it kind of seemed that way during, 
2020. Uh, so that's, that's kind of nice. Uh, but of course, you know, I don't want people to think that, uh, it was luck. It still takes skill. Uh, and we'll, we'll kind of dig into that a little bit as well. So there might be some in the crowd who are initiated. And I was wondering if you could maybe, uh, explain exactly what retail arbitrage is and, and even why that model attracted you compared to some of the others that are out there. Yeah. So retail arbitrage simply is just going into a store that sells goods, anything, right. And, and finding something that you can sell on Amazon or another marketplace for more money. So, you know, pretty simple. Um, I think what attracted us was I had a little bit of background in selling like old toys, like eighties toys, a lot of my childhood stuff. And then I started like buying collections and breaking down and flipping those. So I already kind of knew the toy space, um, you know, with the kids, they're always in different toys. So, you know, we started, okay, let's, let's go to Walmart. We went to Kohl's, we scanned a little bit, you know, got our hands on some products. Um, they kind of got to Ollie's really, Ollie's in Burlington were, were the two big ones to start and, you know, just took it from there. But it was, uh, I don't know. I just thought it was easier to learn with, you know, the product in your hand and you could scan it, type stuff in and uh, a lot easier than just looking at the screen, at least for me. Yeah. I think the immediacy of it is nice too. Like you can take it home and you can ship, you can have a listed FBM and, you know, sell it right away. Or if you want to do FBA, you can ship it tomorrow. You don't have to wait for things. And when you're learning too, there's like the reality of crisis could go down. So to be able to come home and send it off right away um, is something that I like about it. Okay. So a little, little risk aversion, uh, you know, because of the speed of it. I like it. Yeah. A lot of the same principles that we liked about, uh, the BOPUS model you know, mm -hmm. and the, the speed that related to yeah. uh, buy online, pick up in store for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you, can you share some important things that, uh, other sellers think about when they're out doing retail arbitrage, like tools, for example, maybe? Yeah, I think, uh, we keep it pretty simple. I mean. You know, a lot of people like to, to use Scoutify and buy lists and things like that. I haven't gotten into that so much. The one thing that I would say that's a tool that we really utilize is Slack. So, you know, if you get, uh, if for those who don't know what Slack is, it's a messaging app, you create channels in it. So we create channels for every store. We'll create channels for certain sales, you know, outside of just the store. And then I just take a picture, boom, right on the shelf shelf tag price, um, item, and then just sort them how I want in Slack. And then that can be shared with anyone. You can chat with the buyers, you can share with people you're masterminding with, um, just have it for yourself. Right. All right. I haven't been in a Walmart in two months. Or was I getting two months ago? Right. You just open up Slack and start going through your visual Rolodex. And, um, it, it's a nice way to, uh, just have a, a refresher and Slack's free. It's sort of the free version. We have a paid version, but I think it's like $8 a month. I mean, it's very, very affordable. So that's the biggest tool I use that isn't something that's maybe just, you know, a scanning app or things like that. Interesting. Now the, the items go into Slack once you verify that they're profitable or does everything go in and then you, yeah, yeah. You know, we'll scan. I just use the Amazon app to scan. I'm pretty, I'm pretty basic. Uh, so. You know, once, once I've determined it's a buy, uh, you know, just snap the picture. And then from there, you can add a description. You can put any sort of, you know, two pack, three pack, four pack, and put the ASIN in with it. Uh, you can write whatever you'd like. So, you know, I, I just think it's a nice way to, uh, kind of keep things organized. Um, cause there's so much to, to try to remember. I can't remember it all. Interesting. All right. Are you mostly scanning barcodes or are you doing mostly keyword searching? What's, I guess, what's your method when you're standing there in an aisle? I think everything for sure. Um, I mean, we certainly start with the barcodes just because that's typically the fastest. Um, and, and we do try to be speedy because we want to cover as much ground as possible. Um, but yeah, depending on the products, like health and beauty kind of stuff, we'll, we'll be, you know, we're more likely to, to try to type search that um obviously we'll image search um and i think just too after doing it for a little while like sometimes the barcode doesn't scan you know even if it's a toy and they typically do you kind of start to get a feel for like okay like 
but I, I bet this exists. It just something's off it, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything, any kind of method to try to, I mean, we'll even go in the, the regular consumer Amazon app sometimes because sometimes the seller side can even be a little wonky and we'll be like, well, oh, like, let's just double check. So whatever, we'll find it. Yeah, I like that. So, I mean, there's, there's no shortage of selling methods on Amazon, uh, you know, and, and of course these days, uh, people on social media like to talk about making Wi-Fi money and, uh, and things like that. Uh, and, and Chris and I have talked about this. I'm sure we've talked about it on the pod, but we've also talked about it, uh, separately as well. And it just seems like retail arbitrage is kind of talked about the least amount, at least these days. Uh, I know when I started, that's, you know, that's where Chris Green and, and guys like that were always, you know, we're always talking about it. And maybe it's, maybe it's a little less shiny. Maybe it takes a little bit more, uh, you know, elbow grease or, or whatever you might want to call it. But what about RA has, uh, I guess has provided staying power for you guys and kept you from pivoting to another model? I think we had so much success on, a on an ROI level with return early on, you know, from it, that it really just, you know, we, we just continued to develop it. Right. And, and part of it was COVID and everything was up, you know, it, it was just, you know, the, the bubble of, of up, but, um, you know, now I think we've just gotten, I don't want to say so good. That's, that's far too arrogant, but it, it's, we just have our processes and our systems and sales cycles and know where we want to go and when, and, you know, it's, it's a machine that's just continued to churn forward. So, um, and the return is good. I, I think, you know, it, it's, it's some stuff people don't want to do, right? You got to get out, whatever the weather is day, night, you got to see other people in a store, right? You have to interact with the cashier that may or may not be happy to see you, um, you know, go to a lot of stores that are, are dirty and dusty and, you know, that's where the good stuff is. Right. So, um, it's just not sexy in any way, right? My friends are like, what you're, what are you doing? You went to how many dollar generals this week? Like, what are you, what's wrong with you? Right. So yeah, it's not, but if I say, oh yeah, I sit at home and I, uh, you know, flip Nike and Supreme and Lululemon and oh, wow, that's really cool. Right. Well, yeah, but you know, one, uh, one pays the bills really well for us. And, you know, the other one, we, we do do OA. I don't want to say we don't do any OA because we absolutely do. Um, but it's, it's not a lot of the, the more popular stuff. You know, and I, I've actually, I've talked to sellers that have said the dust alone uh -huh. is, is what, you know, they, they can't do RA simply because of the dust. So yeah. um, I, I don't think it takes much for, for people to eliminate RA. So there's certainly. <laughs> certainly opportunity yeah. um what what would you say rough estimates oa to ra or sorry or ra to oa maybe it's uh start with the bigger number i'm imagining. that's a good question i think definitely units far heavier ra um if i had a venture guess i would say in the 70 30 range maybe in terms of like revenue 65 35 because we do we do use a prep center mm -hmm. and we do do like some sales tax arbitrage stuff, uh, especially with toys or some beauty. But, um, you know, we do, we do a lot of, we do a lot of array. So it's still kind of our, you know, bread and butter. Awesome. So, I'm, uh, so I, I've got a little follow up too. So <clears throat> one of the other things, you know, people flipping products at home, uh, is, cash back and, you know, discount gift card as much as they can. And, and some people even say, you know, I'll live on the cash back and, and all of that. Uh, are there any, are there any things like that, that you guys take advantage of, whether it's, it's buying bulk discount gift cards or, you know, using the, the rackets and app to get cash back where you can. Uh, and if so, how do you maximize that doing retail arbitrage? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of small wins you can gain. You mentioned the Rakuten app. Like if I know, like last year, right? GameStop had half off clearance for literally like three months, right? So Rakuten in store was one to 2% in that point in time. So I made sure I always had that turned on, was using that, you know, and that you go spend, you know, 60, $80,000 at, you know, 60 GameStops in, 
you know, the period of two months, well, that, you know, that adds up. Um, discount gift cards, I like using them actually in store more than online because online sometimes, right? You go to check out and you can only use two gift cards or three or in store. I can stand there all day and th there's no limit, right? So, you know, that's definitely um, something we use. Uh, beyond that, you know, just try to make sure you have a good credit card with like base rewards, right? Make sure you're getting at least 2%. I think that's, you know, pretty attainable for most people with, with decent credit, um, you know, which is still the same, just like a widow. Hey, now you're not getting the, you know, like last week, right? Rakuten or even just a few days ago, 15%, 20%, like you're not going to get that in store. So that's certainly, you know, something that you can attain, but, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of little wins you can do. Um, some coupons, you know, make sure you clip coupons if you're going into Walgreens or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. I'm going to add, like, I, this isn't cash back necessarily, but like, it's so store specific. I mean, there's, you know, GameStop being an example where like you buy into their, you know, a certain kind of rewards level, which, you know, if we know we're shopping, then that makes it more beneficial. Um, and even just taking the time to like set up multiple emails so you can have multiple accounts at places. So you always get extra coupons and, you know, it doesn't take that long to do, but a lot of people don't just slow down and do it, even if they know they're going to be shopping somewhere. So, mm. yeah, doing things that way too. Okay. And, and sorry, now I, I'm going to keep going down this little, little trail here. Uh, so how often are you utilizing like store credit card? Like I know TJ Maxx has, what is it? You get 5% or something back every quarter or whatever that is. Um, so how many of those do you use? And then just because I'm an Ohio native and you guys are in Ohio, Chris is in Ohio. How many phone numbers do you have for your M perks at Myers? <laughs> yeah basically um <clears throat> yeah the phone number thing's funny actually um you know I, I think with the uh i'm sorry what was the question the credit card actually blanked store credit card yeah we actually no, don't have no. a lot of store credit cards no if they're going to give you something right so target right red card five percent uh, you mentioned the tj maxx card like i have a i have a walmart card that's five percent rewards Mm -hmm. um, so if it's going to be something significant, especially at a store where my discounted gift card generally isn't above that, um, then I'll, I'll get the store card, but those three for sure. I don't even know what else. Kohl's, we have a cold card, right? Yeah. I can chip double rewards and all that stuff. Along with that. The stores we favor don't have credit cards. Yeah. So okay. they're like the handful <laughs> where it's like, you know, the, the Kohl's, the TJ Maxx. Um, but the stores that we go to the most, which would be like Dollar Generals and Ollie's, those kind, those don't have credit cards. So it just hasn't been a thing. Gotcha. Okay. And are, are you going to tell me how many phone numbers you have for m <laughs> I was in the mire this morning, actually. I really okay. was. Okay. Um, yeah, we don't. But that's our only, like, we only have one close mire. So we don't even, it's not even that close. Yeah, so we don't even frequent that too often. They're building a bunch around us. Sorry. Starting it. At, yeah. At, I always ask because at, at my peak, I had, I had six revolving phone numbers to make sure I could take advantage of it as much as I could. So yeah. I was always curious how many other people had. <laughs> it's a good, so I think probably just two. Yeah. Like two. I always like when I'm doing online stuff, I will change the last digit of my phone number off it, but that, that that's just so they don't track me. That's not for any other reason. <laughs> Hey guys, wanted to take a quick second and thank you for listening to the Clear the Shelf podcast. My magnanimous co-host Chris Rasick has put together a gift for you for being a listener. It's called the Monthly Goal Tracking Spreadsheet and it's free. The spreadsheet will help you break down and track how much you've purchased, which should be a leading indicator of how much you will sell. And then you'll be able to track how much you've sold as well as your estimated monthly profit on a daily basis. This will all feed into the daily averages so you can ensure that you're on track to meet your goals each and every month. Grab it for free today over at cleartheshelf.com forward slash goal dash tracking. Thanks again for being a listener. Now back to the show. Um, okay, so you said 65 to 70% RA is your, your estimate. Mm -hmm. So, and, and by far the, the, in various different or different variations, the most popular question that we got, uh, when we told people that you were, were coming on is 
how the heck do you scale doing mostly RA up to $3 million? Um, how do you yeah. find that much inventory? And this, I mean, this is multiple parts, you know, as far as, you know, we'll get into staffing and storage and stuff like that. It's, uh, you know, there's a couple of different uh, layers to it. But number one, how do you find that much inventory? Let's start with that. Yeah, I think, I, I, and this is going to go back to a previous question of like, you know, why do people not favor RA? Because I think the process of growing it is really boring, right? Like there's, I'm not as good at all these as I once was, but I know multiple people that know every item in Ollie's. Like that's all they, they do millions of dollars a year at only Ollie's and like they know everything. Now for us, you know, we're pretty good with Dollar General. Like that's kind of our, cause they're just everywhere out here. It's like on every street corner. But, um, you know, we, we kind of use what's around. So yeah, I mean, I would say that's pretty much it. I think too, we've, and we didn't know this at the beginning, but it's how we treat it now. Um, we've come to see that the good RA opportunities are very much kind of like a drop everything and go and take advantage of it. Um, you know, he's, he's sourcing this weekend. He was gone literally. I mean, he left before 6 a.m., you know, and, and now home at night. Um, we'll do the same thing tomorrow. We'll do the same thing Sunday. Like we won't see him, you know, for a couple of days. And then on the flip side, there's a couple of sales that I shop really well that as soon as we hear about it, it's me all day, multiple days, you know, for the week that the sale's going on or whatever. Um, and that's worth it to us mm -hmm. to invest the time on those days very heavily because we can get so much that it allows us to ease off many other days during the month and still just work through stuff so it's definitely working for us um it's hard on the days you know that that we have to go um but in a month it really like it really evens out and so we've just kind of accepted the fact that like when it's really good we're going after it and when it's not as good that's where we can play catch up and you know process process what we have yeah yeah, I think when we, when we first started, it was more of like, all right, I'm going to, because we're like right in between like Pittsburgh and Cleveland, kind of diagonally there. So like you could drive to a suburb of any, either city and just like, I'm going to go to the Walgreens. I'm going to go to the Walmart and the tar like we go to one of everything right in that town. Now we rarely do that. It's like, okay, store X is having this great sale that happens once, twice, five times a year. We're going to hit as many of those stores as humanly possible during the length of the sale. And then we'll like relax and okay, two weeks from now, this store is having this sale that only comes around once, twice. And we just go, you know, as crazy as we can on that and then stop, get it prepped, get it sent in. So that that's kind of turned into, it's really like a buy cost, you know, just trying to get that down as much as possible. Even if you have to kind of filter stuff in or hold a little bit. Uh, maybe not send all of it in. It, it's it's just worth it from a buy cup perspective. So, is your guys is are you guys much more in the in the depth game then versus the width, or is it a little bit of both? I, I guess how does that how does that work for you guys? Both for <laughs> sure. I mean, we always have. We're always above about two thousand active basins. Um, you know, with, with inventory either on the way or, or at Amazon. So pretty wide, but you know, I have no problem going deep on, especially depends what it is, right? It's actually kind of go deeper OA. Yeah. Um, for sure. Especially with the, a lot of like the toy knowledge that I've built up, right? If I know this toy is near the end or if there's only so many ways to get it and you know, all these wholesalers, whatever, um. I'll go pretty deep on a toy that I'm feel pretty strongly in like the long-term outlook of. Um, but yeah, you know, if the, if the buy cost is right, I have no, like there's some stuff I'm getting this weekend that'll probably sit until closer to fall and, you know, we'll send it in and it'll be Q4, but you know, it's just at a price you can't pass up. Okay. So I have to, I have to ask because I'm sure that someone will, will comment this, uh, you know, on the episode, but, uh, so with your knowledge in toys and, uh, and, you know, being willing to, to kind of go deep on toys, 
how do you deal with uh, CPC issues since a lot of it's coming, you know, RA and OA rather than direct from a manufacturer or, or a distributor? Yeah, I think the first thing is you just have to accept it, right? I think there's so many things with Amazon that if you just accept it, it doesn't sting as bad, right? Like I know at minimum three to 4%, unless it's all grocery, like of everything I sell is getting returned and mm -hmm. probably 10% of that stuff returned is going to be trashed, right? So if I just accept that from day one, not so bad. Um, so that's kind of the same. I just think, you know, with CPC, okay, like it, you get a feel for generally if Amazon sells it, probably not going to get hit um, more often than not. If it's a store exclusive, right? It's only at Walmart. It's only a Target here, there. That's going to get taken down eventually. It just it's not going to last, but it'll probably come back, and it'll probably be even more profitable than before it went away. And so you know, there's so many avenues too to to sell if you have to. We do a little bit of eBay. Uh, we do have a Walmart account. We haven't really used it yet just from a time factor, but, um, a lot of that stuff moved really well over there. And, um, yeah, I think you just kind of have to accept that it's a thing. And there's certain websites like Lego, you can go and get the docs and stuff like that. And some wholesalers, we can request them, but largely it's, it's kind of hard to, to pull those out of people. Now, I know you guys, you guys have talked about being really good at dollar general and, and I don't think, I don't think that was arrogant. I think, I think everyone should have a store or two that they, uh, they can absolutely crush. Uh, and you guys have talked about toys and, and your knowledge of toys. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this question might be, a, a you know, something we've already answered, but are there certain categories or stores that have absolutely helped accelerate your growth? Uh, and if so, how, I guess, what did you do to make sure that you could learn everything you could about those categories and or stores? Um, I think we've definitely had a few that have ex like pushed our growth forward, but, and they have changed throughout the last, you know, three years. Um, and there was. Some of them, the sale was, you know, very temporary. He mentioned Burlington. That was one of the ones early on when Burlington's, re Burlington's reopened after COVID, everything was 50% off. Um, so like that store, I mean, we did that for like two months. We traveled to a couple different states even. Yeah. Um, so I, just to interrupt real quick, that's yeah. a great example of like chasing a big sale. So like when Burlington reopened, everything was half off, but when they reopened in Ohio, that was different when they reopened in PA, in Michigan, in New York. And so we did all four states very heavily because I want to say Ohio was first and Michigan was second, then PA, New York was last. And so it gave us time spread out over like six weeks to, to kind of hit them all. And you just, everything was so cheap, right? It was just, it was crazy. Um, but so. No, that's fine. So like, I think that early on was like a store that pushed us forward a lot we had just gotten ungated with toys we you know could do some like more expensive stuff um then it we kind of like went into this phase of like local stores like local grocers and that kind of stuff and we really took off with that that has since backed off because their receipts aren't as good and we are smarter now and we just you know know better than we did in the beginning um but that was a, a big deal for us because we were getting things that weren't available everywhere and, um, and now it is, it, it's like Dollar General. We have, you know, a place where we, we do a lot of cosmetic sourcing. He has some places that he buys toys from, um, and those, you know, learning them and it, to answer your question about like learning as much as you can, I think it's just, it's kind of like this delicate balance of like trusting your gut when like you really know something is good and not trying to convince yourself that something is good when you need to just kind of like relax and test it. Um, we try to do that with each other, but then we also have a group now and, and it's the village. It's who we run the village with, which is Sarah and Tracy. And then there's, there's another guy as well that we talk to a lot. Um, and we all sell the same stuff. We like to sell the same stuff. We like to source the same way. We look at products the same. And so we really work together a ton on that. And if one of us is missing something, then chances are somebody else will catch it or think of it or, you know, whatever it might be. So, um, 
Yeah, so definitely a lot of stores, and, and who knows what it'll be six months from now. It might even change then, so. Um, so what, uh, $3 million, is it, it can't just be the two of you, right? Is there, I mean, you talked about your network, you know, the village and whatnot, but do, do yeah. you have helpers within your Little, own store? Like I said, we do utilize a prep center, um, mm -hmm. for OA that makes sense. We do have a lot of OA that comes home as well. Right. But if, you know, we can sales tax arbitrage it, that makes sense. Um, we'll, we'll send it there. So we do have some prep help. Um, what we have here where we live, uh, we have a four car detached garage. Um, uh, yeah, so it's right. Yeah. That's why we bought the house. Um, so that's perfect. That's got it upstairs. It's got plenty of storage space. So we have currently 27 hours of in-house prep help. I know it's a very specific number, but, um, so there's a few family friends that just, uh, have prepped for us for the last couple of years and, you know, like. Uh, one gentleman works 10 hours, um, another lady works 14 and one works three. So that's 27 mm -hmm. and that is our, our prep help. Um, so that's it. There's no VAs. There's no, um, administrators, nothing like it's, it's her and I, and you know, we are busy. We have a number of kids and, uh, so she takes care of that. And, uh, so it's a lot of me, but you know, a lot of her too. And, uh, that's really that's the team. We do utilize some buyer, like, so all the guy, um, he actually went out today, um, for like big sales that I will use to go kind of help. And that's where Slack comes in. He can jump on Slack and, you know, see what's, see what's going on. And I can update it in real time, right? If I find something at the store, I put it in there and he's got it instantly. So, um, you know, we'll do that, but it's, that's not very often, um, <laughs> You know, I'd say maybe six times a year for that. So, you know, not, not a ton. Um, if she goes on like a longer trip away for certain stores, her mom might go with her and they, you know, she helps, but they get dinner and hang out and have, you know, mom, daughter time, stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. That's the team. We also, just to be fair, it's what we wanted. Yeah. Um, we don't want a team of VAs. We don't want to outgrow working on our own property, you know, in, in a build, like, I think, I think we would like to continue to grow because we're getting better at what we're doing. But as far as wanting to get like a bigger space and a huge team, like we don't want to grow like that big. Um, this is kind of where we, what we want for ourselves. You don't want to have to manage people, right? We <laughs> no, I, I manage a big no, staff we do we talk prior about to uh, uh you know i had a job i did for six years where i was managing 60 70 people um i have another business currently that has uh, about eight people um that the gentleman i, I co-own it with he he runs it but like i don't want like our preppers they just come in they do their thing they leave they set their own hours they you know i don't i don't want to manage like one single person and i like people but um I don't like employees. <laughs> no, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's just kind of what we settled on. I think, I, uh, sorry, go ahead. I give, uh, <clears throat> I, my mom works. She does prep for me uh, nice. and, uh, just five hours a week of her that that's enough. You know, <laughs> I managed at the bank and, and that was its own nightmare, but I mom for five. Well, let, let me ask a follow-up question. Say hypothetically, you had a relative say it's your mom um and you were paying slave wages to her um and, and you know taunting her with not being able to see her grandchildren unless she works you know, how hard can you push a relative before they bring object <laughs> that's just no I'm, I'm teasing my mom hoping that she's listening to it that's yeah uh, <laughs> i like to joke about that so don't answer that that's yeah we've we do have it's all relatives or friends because it is at the house. And even though it's in a separate building and, you know, the keypad, whatever, you know, but still it's before that it, it was in our attached garage at our, our previous home. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, the kids are around, you, you want to know. Yeah. And it was a shared bathroom. They like, if they had to use the restroom during their shift, they came in the house to use it where like, you know, the kids right. are running around. So yeah. 
Yeah, I think that also was a little bit of a factor was just we knew that whoever we brought around, like we really, really had to know them and trust them. And, you know, it wasn't just about how they were as an employee, like they also had to be a person that we didn't mind being around our family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think this is a I think this is a big takeaway moment for people. And because. One, I think when people hear, you know, $3 million in, in sales, they're like, well, there's, there's no way you've got to have a team. You've got to have sourcers, you know, and, uh, and things like that. Honestly, that question was probably asked, I don't know, by three different people at least. Uh, so it's, it's good to know that you can grow to that size without necessarily having to have a, a large team or, or even two or three shoppers. Um, and then the other thing that I really liked is you guys, you're building a lifestyle business, you know, it, I don't know, especially on Twitter, which Twitter is my favorite social media app, but, uh, hustle culture still seems to be a little bit more ingrained in those folks over there. Uh, you know, and, and it's, I've got to get to as big as I possibly can, uh, you know, what, uh secure the bag or just stack, I don't know, bricks or whatever they're calling it these days, you know, and, uh, instead of, instead of realizing that it's okay to build a business based on the kind of life that you want to have. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I guess I want to, I want to detour just a little bit. What, uh, what kind of life do you guys want to have and, and how do you optimize for that? you know, having a business out of the home. You know, I think, especially with kids, it's nice to be able to just drop everything. Oh, you know, this one has a play today at 10 o'clock at the school, or today there was a mother's day thing. She went to a one thirty with our oldest, you know, like, oh, we don't, it's a beautiful day. We're going to go to the park at eight o'clock because school's out and we want to be like, you know, we work a lot. Um, we definitely put in the hours, but it's hours when we want to, right? When I can't sleep at two 30 in the morning, I grab the computer and I source a little bit and answer some emails and, you know, research for the next day and do what I need to do. Um, it, it's just not a set thing. So we're able to, you know, it's family time. There's a doctor's appointment. We want to go on a trip. Um, you know, this person's going here, there, it's all, uh, it's priority, right? The family becomes priority instead of having to f- do everything around work, right? I have this work schedule that is inflexible and I have to kind of fit the family around that. The family is whatever you want it to be. And then we fit the work around that. We do too, um, like thinking ahead. Um, we, we, we do like what we do. Like we like the hunt of retail arbitrage and we like going out together and finding things or, you know, it, it's a little bit fun still, even after three years. And so we do like joke about how we don't really ever see ourselves stopping doing it just because it's really hard. You go to a, a grocery store and you see clear and stuff. Like, how do you walk by it when you know that you might be able to make money? Like you're never going to walk by that stuff. Um, but I think we also do realize that like, we have no clue how long Amazon FBA is going to be a thing for us, for everyone, you know, like we just don't know. And so the reality is to like, you have to be very smart with the money you make and, and how you, you know, treat things moving forward. So, um, we're very happy with how we're doing right now. And we, other than buying the house, which like he said, we bought it for the garage. Um, we haven't really changed anything. Like we're trying to be very smart with everything that we're doing that way, you know, down the road, like the pressure is not there if, and when we do kind of start to back off from this or not do this or, you know, however it turns out, cause we don't. Mm-hmm. How much, how much of your guys's catalog, uh, would you say is, uh, is new items that you're testing compared to replenishable items that you guys get on a fairly regular basis? Yeah. Oh, that's hard. Um, yeah, that is a hard question. I hate the word replen too. Like that's just, uh, <laughs> you know, like everything, I don't know. That's, that's a whole lot of thing, but, um, 
I definitely think, you know, I'll bring up Dollar General again since that's what we're going with. You know, like if you take, and this is going to sound crazy to people, right? And this is why people want it. You take three months and over those three months, you have scanned every inch of Dollar General. You'll have, you know, 60, 70 replens, right? At least. And then all kinds of other stuff that's, yeah, pretty good. And if there's a sale, right, it becomes great. And, you know, during that week of the sale or those couple of days, you can, you can get it right. So if you have stores around, it doesn't have to be Dollar General. It could be Trader Joe's. It could be any, you know, anybody, anywhere, um, you know, just trying to, to find items. Um, I think a lot of our OA is more one on for sure. You know, RA, we're kind of finding the same things in the same stores. Every Kohl's you go in kind of has the same stuff, right? Every Walmart's kind of got the same stuff. Um, so that's more replen based. OA is a little more one off, you know, sale type things. But it's, it's not yeah. something we ever think of. Like we never no. think of that when we're like sourcing. No. It, if it comes home and it sells, then we want more. And typically, since we are willing to drive other places, and we, you know, source a lot of stores that like we don't think other people source very much. Like it's not all Walmart, Target, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, but like in some ways, it feels like everything is a replan for us to some extent, even though that's never what we see out. In fact, like I swear the one month we like, we're like, we're going to have a replan business. <laughs> like we've never been so bad at sourcing than yeah, when we were that doing that. <laughs> yeah. Chris, Chris is very vocal about his, his distaste for the term replant as well. Wow, right. Uh, and we've, we've talked about it because I mean, honestly, anything you buy has the possibility, you know, as long as if you can source it for a low enough price, I mean, everything has the possibility of being a replant. So I get it. It, it is a great marketing term though. And, and it works to, yeah. it does work that way. Yes. So uh, I always like to ask, uh, I've asked Chris probably like four or five different times since I've, I've known him, but I wrote this question thinking that you had more help than you actually do, so, but, uh, I'll ask it anyway, but what would you say is the ceiling as far as sales volume goes for a one person operation that focused mostly on RA? No outside prep help, just, just one. Yeah. Just. Yeah. I mean, I would say without working in it, just an insane amount, right? Um, north of a million for sure, somewhere, you know, maybe just shy of like one and a half. Um, I think that's a tano. It depends on what you like to source, right? It depends on your average sale price. You know, if you're grinding Dollar Tree, that's, you're not going to get there. Uh, but if you're doing, you know, like we like a lot of beauty, right? You can, mm -hmm. You can get a pretty decent average sale price in a very physically small item. Um, so, you know, stuff like that. Or if you get into apparel and shoes and, you know, a little higher electronics and average, average price, that's higher. You can get there. Um, but I think, you know, in the million to million and a half range without totally killing yourself is, is doable. If you're smart, you know what you're doing. So a follow-up question, um, is your family vehicle a box truck then? <laughs> We wish. I wish today. <laughs> yeah. I drove out way further than I needed to because I got full way too. Um, yeah. no, she has a van and I have a, a larger SUV. We, you know, we've talked about buying like just a straight sourcing vehicle, whether that's like, you know, a, a bigger, bigger van that's just empty, right? With a bin or some sort of, you know, box truck, anything like that. But. Yeah, we've resisted that, but it's getting closer to becoming. That's probably the reality. next. It's just the wrong time yeah. to, be, to be doing that kind of approach. Yeah, the the interest rates are are not uh, not in your favor at the moment when it comes no. to those kind of, and the and the prices are still inflated. Yeah. Do you guys ever rent uh, a trailer or anything like that, or is it just? No, I, I filled up the SUV, I filled up the, the van, and so it's time to go home. We haven't. Um, so same thing. We've talked about it several times. 
I think we haven't actually had the need to because most of the space consuming stuff um, would be like a Dollar General where there are so many in such a close radius that it's not an issue to come home at the end of the day. Um, any sourcing that we've done where we do have to travel like farther to to hit multiple stores where we would have to stay the night in like a hotel or something, that's all usually like more compact stuff. And so space typically is not as much of an issue. Um, so yeah, again, something we've talked about, but not something we've actually. Yeah, I think family, at least for me, I think family too, like, I like to try to be home before the boys go down for bed, you know, if at all possible, sometimes it's not, but you know, if, if we didn't have kids or whatever, I think we would definitely be like, we would just be out in the way sourcing until we, you know, whatever massive vehicle was full and then come back, you know, two weeks later, who knows? Um, but you know, I, I like to get home every night and at least see them before they go to bed at worst. Mm-hmm. I used to coach basketball, high school basketball, and haven't done that for a few years now, but you know, that kind of kept me around too, where I just couldn't get too far away. But, um, yeah, I like to get on. So you guys talked about, and, and I, I know it hasn't been very long, at least I, I mean, Alexa, I see, I see your stories and your posts. So I know the house, your new house, you guys haven't been there too awful long, right? Uh, six months. Yeah, yeah. First week of January. First week of January. Okay. So you talked about, you bought the house because it's got that detached four car mm-hmm. garage. Uh, but I'm curious how, ha- as you guys have grown, how have your storage needs changed? And other than, you know, buying a house for the essentially built in warehouse, uh, how have your solutions evolved for those storage needs over time? Yeah, that's so uh, another well, a black mark here on RA, I guess. I do certainly understand people that say, I don't want it taking over my home. Um, and I think, you know, prior to January, we had a, a decent sized house, but you know, two car, smaller attached garage. And like, I look back, I think, how did we live? How did we function in that house? You know, like there's just stuff like we got rid of the dining room, right? Because that just became storage There's stuff in the basement. There's stuff in the entry, the hallways, like, like the literally the hallways of the home yeah. were live with boxes where you would have to like turn sideways to get through yeah and we joke about it all the time because it wasn't till we moved out and didn't have to do that anymore like we'll look and we'll be like that was so like bad for us um so yeah that's that was really hard yeah um and now we you know especially since the garage is we have a three car attached but a four car detached and there's not there's not a single unit of Amazon inventory in the home, in the attached garage. It's all out there, staying out there. You know, the two never show up, right? So um, it's definitely better for mental health and all of that stuff, right? It's just nice. Your home is your home, and that is work. Mm-hmm. I think the arrangement, too, I will be honest, I think we're still figuring it out. Um, yeah. You know, it's been a little over four months, but we've done everything very, I was going to say slowly, which is ironic because we scaled very quickly. But as far as like adding on things, we kind of like, like we took way too long to get a repricer. We took way too long to get a prep sitter. We took way too long to hire prep help the first time. Like everything, we like waited too long to do it. And so we're not treating the new space any different. Like we are living in it for a while before we decide like, okay, like where is the storage going to go? How do we want the prep to flow? All that stuff. It's, it's still very much a work in progress. Mm-hmm. I, I'm always curious, uh, because I, I know that everyone's a little bit different, but you, you talked about how, you know, it wasn't good to have all of the inventory take over the home and things like that. Yeah. What I'm always wondering, especially with folks who have kids like yourself and, and Chris and myself, was it, <clears throat> was it bribery or was it threats of physical harm that kept the kids out of the toys and out of the inventory? I think it, it gets to a point, at least it did for us where it's just so present. They don't know anything else and they almost don't even care. Like, Oh, look at that. And then they just like, it was, it's just, it's always there. Right. It's like, 
the picture of Anne Bertha on the wall or whatever. It's, it's part of the home. So, you know, it might be something new all the time. It's coming, it's gone, it's here and it's there, but largely they don't, they still don't. They'll go in the garage and just, they don't care. They want to sit on the lawnmower over there, right? Like that's the truth. They don't care about the toys ever. They do. They want to, and our oldest is six, our youngest is two. So they're all pretty little still. Um, but more than anything, like more than they want the toys, they just want to like help and be a part of yeah. it. So if they can like sort things or stack things, or if the six year old can put stickers on things, like that is to them the greatest thing they can do. Yeah, my uh, my youngest was the biggest thief. Uh, <laughs> she she's grown out, but uh, I guess even Willy Wonka gets sick of chocolate, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um. So I, I, I know you have, uh, you, you kind of, you talked about how you kind of batch, um, your, your sourcing trips and whatnot. So this might be a little difficult, but, uh, another frequent question was what does your daily routine look like? If you could summarize think, that. This one is super hard for me because I think every day is just so different. Um, you know, do we have prep help? Do we not? Cause I still like, I box up all the shipments and, you know, I print almost all of the SKU labels, you know, like, so it, it depends on if we have help or not. It depends on if we're chasing a sale or not. Um, but largely like a standard day, I don't sleep super well, you know, five hours is plenty for me. So like I'm up or like today I was up at four ish, um, did some work on the computer, got ready, left the house. And now today I was chasing a sale. So I was really out today, but got gas. Um, hit a Meyer and a couple of Walmarts before, uh, Dollar General opened at eight and then did that all day till the car was full, got back at, uh, like five and, um, that was it. Dinner, mowed the lawn and, and here we are. So that's, uh, you know, that's a day, but, um, I don't know. I'm gonna what have a, I, I don't, I think that's super hard to answer to because yeah. the kids are home with me a lot more now. Um, and next month they're going to be home with me a lot more you know, again, because we're actually giving up our babysitter because we finally reached a point where I can kind of like be the only one to watch them. Um, so I do like, I have my little handful of stores that I source online every single day, um, uh, that, you know, I'll check them morning, middle of the day at some yeah. point in night, you know, like I, I just kind of do them. If it is chasing a sale, like that is what I will do. He will take the kit, the full schedule changes because this is me sourcing. Um, but other than that, it's just kind of like what needs done and what tiny pocket of time do we have to do so? And I don't, there, there's often a lot of talk, uh, you know, of SOPs and processes and things like that. Do, do you guys like it? Do you guys prefer it this way? You know, that, you know, things are, it's not necessarily, I don't want to say disorganized because that's not a fair, I don't think that's a fair term. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, but do you, do you like the way that your lifestyle is compared to trying to run it like, a you know, a fortune 500 or something like that, that, and that seems where a lot of Amazon sellers want to go these days. I think I'm going to answer it. Um, I think when you have multiple children and you make plans that repeatedly <laughs> <laughs> get broken because you wake up in the morning and find out that one is sick and then the next one is sick the next day. And now you have 12 doctors. And like that can only happen so many times before you throw the idea of a schedule to the wind. And so like. I don't think it was the intent to be that way from the beginning, but it definitely got to a point where we were just like, we like, it's just not real. Like we have little kids, they get sick a lot and things happen. And so now it's very day by day. And we do like, we regroup every single night together. Like, here's what we hope to do tomorrow. Here's what we hope it will look like. But then we also regroup in the morning. Like, okay, did we all make it through the night healthy? Then we're going to go through with that plan. Did we not make it through healthy? Here's how it's going to change. And, and that's just worked, you know, since because 
then it's just not as big of a deal when it gets broken. Yeah. There's that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We definitely like every Sunday, the kids call it a business meeting. Like we'll sit down every Sunday, really go over the week and kind of hit the, the highlights of maybe the month or the next couple months ahead. And, but yeah, it is very, and this was very hard for me at first. Cause I, I definitely do like a routine, um, but with the kids and with the, it just every, it's, it's almost impossible. So mm-hmm. it's you know, wake up and work and do the best you can and try to get them on. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I sort of like that. I, I'm not, I'm not so great with the SOPs and the, you know, all the processes and things like that. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm on the same page as you guys. I do have, I do have kind of a follow-up question though. And you know, I've only got one, one kid and he's nine. Uh, and I don't know if you guys can answer this or Chris can answer this, but when do their noses stop incessantly running and when do they stop always being sticky? <laughs> not yet. I don't. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, and COVID seems to have changed all kinds of stuff there too. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a great mystery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And my, my youngest, the one that doesn't go to school gets sick the most. I don't, I don't know if she's sneaking out at night or where'd she go to get none of, none of the, nobody in the house is sick. And then at the four-year-old, it, it get runny nose or something. What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What, uh, what does your guys' strategy look like for like aging inventory and liquidating and things like that? Cause I mean, it doesn't matter how good you are. Yes. There's going to be a bad buy or there's going to be, uh, things that you can't control because we, it's such a, a dynamic marketplace. Yeah. I, so I did the repricing. Uh, I think I'm pretty laid back more than most. I really don't get too concerned until about 120 days. Um, I kind of, you know, I set the min and max, and, you know, we use seller snap as our repricer and I just kind of, you know, let, let it ride. That's what we have set. Um, and it generally worked pretty well. Um, we don't try to get like the fastest volume. We're more for higher profit. It's kind of how our pricing is geared. Um, Capital, I don't want to say capital is not an issue because it's, I think it's probably an issue for everyone at some point, but it's not the biggest need, right? I don't, I think sometimes we fall into this trap of, wait, if I just get my money back and reinvest it into something good, you know, I got to get it back and make it work for me. Well, if you're constantly doing that and constantly, you know, taking losses, are you really getting it back and putting it in something that's as good as you think it is, or maybe your sourcing isn't, you know, all that you, you think now there are certainly times for that. Um, but I think it's kind of just become a crutch of, oh, I had to liquidate and just get it back. And, you know, I, I try to really, especially with like, we've had a few bad buys, like bad courses and everybody does, but I really try to kind of do a post-mortem and look and say, okay, is there something I missed? Right. Is there, is there something in the keep? Is there something with, I didn't check this wholesaler or that one, or, you know, were things in stock that I wasn't looking at? that I could have seen, or is this just bad luck? Um, or, you know, it's demand just really dried up for some reason or something that, you know, wasn't foreseeable, but, um, yeah, about 120 days, I'll really look at like, okay, you know, I might knock the minimum down to like 0% ROI and just let same thing, let their pressure do its thing. And it used to be, I didn't really care about like liquidation until 180. Now with the fee changes. I'm a little closer to, to 150 on that. Cause you, I don't really want it to hit 180 days, but I'll let stuff ride a little longer. I'm not, you know, I don't get too wound up about IPI and things like that. Like it's doesn't matter all that much in my opinion. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, honestly, monthly storage fees really are not that high, you know, based yeah. on what we, we get for it. Um, is, uh, so let me, let me ask this. When we're doing OA, you know, we've got 37 different tools that at our disposal at all times. Mm-hmm. So when you're out doing RA, what, what tools are you using to make sure that you're making a good buy? Um, for me, super simple. So Amazon seller app, that's what I scan with. 
been the keep app a good bit. And then also depending on if it's something new, right? A lot of this, you're coming across the same stuff all the time, but if it's something where there's like a lot of inventory, I will just jump on Google real quick and, and type it in and see like, Hey, who's selling it? Is any, well, wait, nobody's selling this or everybody's selling it. And you know, everybody's cheaper or, you know, log into, like I said, different wholesalers we have accounts with and see like, do they have this product or is nobody carrying it or, you know, but largely it's Keepa and, and the seller app for me. That's, that's what I use is pretty simple. Yeah, I would agree with that too. And I think this is kind of just like an off comment, but I think sometimes that's difficult for people who are so used to having a ton of tools at their disposal to make every single decision. And like I would do calls with people and like they what they could have been selling for a year or two years, and yet they have zero confidence to stand in a store and buy the item right then and there. They feel like they have to take a picture and go home and research it. Or, you know, like they have to do that because they feel like they can't make that decision in the store. And I mean, certainly, yes, like a, a lot of those tools, you know, are great and can lead to better decisions. But um, but I I kind of like the simplicity of it. And I, I like the fact that we've never overdone that because I just see how it affects some other people sometimes. Um, and I, I see, I think they miss out on stuff. You know, you're leaving in a store and you can buy it right there, but then you're going to go home and you're going to come back and you're going to get it. So, um, yeah, we've... I do want to add one tool that may be a little, um, <laughs> not necessarily a tool, but she mentioned our mastermind. We had a lot to, and then the, the three other folks, you know, if I'm not sure about, Hey guys, like I'll throw out the ASIN, mm -hmm. you know, what do you guys think of the Keepa? And, and somebody might see it and answer quickly or not or whatever, or, has anybody ever sold this or just anything, right? Is there something I'm missing here? Like this seems amazing. Surely it can't be this good, right? You know, like bring me back down to earth. And that really is worth a ton, right? Because you get all those experiences and everything they've done and they're all, you know, seven figure sellers and things like that. And so being able to lead on a small group of coworkers almost in a way, even though we're not working for the same team, uh, we're on our own teams, but you know, masterminding together has been, you know, people want to grow. I think that's one of the the fastest ways to grow is yeah. find a like-minded group of people that are, we're all very geographically different. We have different stores. We're not, you know, bumping elbows and, and ollies or anything, but, um, you know, it, it's really helped our growth for sure. We started that a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's been invaluable. And I do just to like clarify how that kind of came to fruition um, we did not start that. Correct. Somebody else posted in a Facebook group and I give him all the credit in the world because he was very specific about, I want people who are committed, like this is their full-time job, who put in the hours, who are ungated in XYZ because that's what I love. Like he had very clear criteria for what he wanted. And I made Steve message <laughs> him to join and um and it did it started as a larger group in q4 when there are plenty of bolos to share without you know being worried um we all were spread out across the country that was a requirement we didn't want two people you know too close uh geographically and um yeah it started as a larger group and then it you know as naturally happens, it kind of pairs down to like who really meshes and who really works well together. And so that was how it formed. Um, and so I think we talk about that a lot, like creating a group with some people and, you know, you can't just wake up and do it. Like it, it does take, you need to know what you want. You need to know what you're looking for, what your expectations are. And even if, when you outline that, it might still take, you know, a half a year, a year to really like hone it down to, to who is going to be your people. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I, we've had, I think we're coming up on two years on, on my mastermind and, uh, it, it's far different than what it yes. started. You know, it was, we started out as a, a Bopus mastermind and, you know, it's, uh, basically a group of friends, you know, that, that mm -hmm. support each other after yeah. two years. So, um, but that's, that, that's a great point. Um, you know, 
we can't stress it enough uh, about how valuable a network is, you know, and that's, that's immediate feedback and immediate value from that mastermind to be able to, to have that resource, you know, to, to bounce stuff off. Um, and, and Alexa, that's, that's a great point about, um, people relying on tools. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to write that down. It's, I, I wonder if, you know, people, I, I've talked about people thinking that there's a, a, a starter kit to buy, you know, and it's like, okay, I need this. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this because they're, um, they're mimicking orange bars that they see on whatever social media or what, however they, whatever sparked the interest initially. And, um, uh, it's almost, I guess you can have so many tools that you almost rely on them for the validation instead of mm-hmm. actually using them to help you create mm-hmm. your own criteria, you know, your own buying criteria that if it hits X number of factors, it's a buy, you know, uh, that kind of gets lost on, on what you're using the tools for. So that, that, that was, yeah, I think that's spot on. Um, we got a, a question from Twitter. Um, they wanted to know what, uh, what's one of your favorite flips? Um, well, I think we each take, well, I'll go first. So it was, I want to say June of 2020. So we've been at it really, like we didn't really start till March. So we're pretty new, um, kind of found a local liquidator that I didn't know existed pre Amazon. And we came across almost an entire pallet of a retired Lego set. It was a Disney car set. Um, we were, we were ungated in Lego and this is back. You know, before you could just when ungating was difficult. <laughs> send in a picture of your dog and get ungated, right? Mm-hmm. You know, this was when it was kind of a thing still. And uh, we end up selling them on eBay and like cash flow, certainly. Like we didn't start with a ton, but we were okay. But, you know, on eBay, right? You're getting, that's before the weekly payouts. Like you've got money right then, like the next day. So, Boom, sold a bunch to a guy in Texas. And then I was like, Lexic, like, I'm going back and buying more. And then we bought a lot more of the pal. And like within about a two week span, we sold them all and made, mm-hmm. I don't remember the exact number now, but thousands of that. Yeah. Like, we, of um, we paid $9 per Lego set and we sold them on eBay in the 50s. Had we been able to sell them no. on Amazon, it was in the 90s. So mm-hmm. that hurt, but it was still really. And also, we didn't have a just a liquidator. You don't get a real receipt, right? So it's not something we were going to flip anyway. But uh, you know, if we were ungated, but it was it was huge just to continue to snowball those profits. We went seven months before taking any profit out of the business, and that really helped kind of grow the inventory and snowball that forward. Mine was an eyeshadow. Um, there was a, a, it was Urban Decay brand. Oh. It was called ABC Gum. Rest in peace. I yeah. Know. And, um, I mean, we, like, it was on Nordstrom Rack, so you could buy as many as you want. And we just, we sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of that specific one. And it led us to so many other good eyeshadows, a really good primer, like that one. Same thing, like snowballing, but not mm-hmm. the profits just for like items. I mean, that, singular item led us to one of our biggest brands for like two years yeah our biggest brand yeah sure. and you said it was called abc got like like the night like already been chewed <laughs> yeah. what it's ABC right? got. yeah yes. interesting yeah the names of cosmetics are just ridiculous yeah. Yeah. Need them. yeah it's terrible certain brand no. and that's that, that that one that one was a hard loss. Uh, that brand, oh, unfortunately, one of the best that that's two years by yeah. far most profit. Yeah. Uh, now I know I know kids are getting ready to get out of school. Uh, yours, uh, mine, Chris's. Uh, but that is that's a pretty good time for uh, thinking about back to school, of course. And uh, this question also comes from Twitter. Do you guys have a particular game plan for different seasons like back to school season, maybe certain products that you go harder on or certain retailers that you spend more time in for, uh, for those kind of things? I am super down on seasonal, like almost everything. Um, however, back to school would be my favorite of the seasons I don't like. So, you know, it's book. Backpacks sell year round, right? Packs of socks sell year round. Um, 
we don't do i think seasonal is really hard like we've oh, wow. never been great at seasonal no and we definitely have tried and we we do have a few things i would say halloween might be like our best seasonal yeah. thing that we can do but we're not even great at it um and i think we've just Again, this is like an example of like everybody like talking seasonal. Oh, this is coming up. You got to do this. Keep this in mind. And I think we've tried that quite a few times. We're not great at it. Our time is better spent somewhere else. And we just not to say we don't do it at all, but like it's just not. I would say I accidentally do seasonal like the mire I was at this morning. Um Chopping around, whatever, get back towards the pet. And they have one of those little, you know, four sided things there with the clearance like they have at Meyer. And they had a bunch of Yankee candle, um, their Christmas cookie air fresheners. They look like a little Yankee candle jar. You know, you hang them in your car. They were like a dollar 27. Profit was great. Even right now, rank, eh, not so great. But like I had two bagged them. I don't know how many I had 50 or 60. And then I'll send those in, you know late September, right? Early October. And just like, we'll do that. Um, I wasn't looking for them. I wasn't trying to do, you know, Christmas, uh, air fresheners today. They just kind of, you know, stumbled upon them. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm bad at seasonal. Uh, I think if you don't hit it right, then are you liquidating? What are you doing? Um, and we also don't like to FBM. No. And that's part of, I mean, I like, that's part of, yeah. If you want FBM, go for it. Yeah. Um, another question from Twitter. Um, this, this is a good one. Uh, it's certainly a lot easier to, uh, identify anti-reseller, uh, websites doing OA. Um, are there any stores that we should avoid, uh, doing RA or is there anything, who are the, who are the seller haters out there in the RA world? I think the only one that I've ever had any sort of consistent trouble with is Target. Um, they seem to be the largest one out there that is just super anti reseller. She does a lot better than me, right? She looks like she could have a whole castle of kids. Yeah. For me, I'm just a wonderful woman buying things for children. Yeah. He's the horrible person who's like taking. Yeah. It depends who's shopping. I think it's more of like, not so much a store thing. It's more of a mentality for me. Like, you know, people will ask. And I try not to lie, but I also, you know, oh, what church are you with? Or what are you doing? You know, like, and I just kind of say yes to everything, kind of like the improv idea of like, if you just say yes, like we never say no, right? We just keep the, we keep it going. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I don't know. Uh, but sometimes people are just, everyone's so nosy, right? Like they just want to, we kind of knowing how to talk to people, um, how to talk to cashiers. And not in a, you're doing anything wrong way, but just a, how do I get out of the store with like these, without these people like scowling at me as I have my cart <laughs> full of whatever of clearance that nobody's wanted for years, by the way, it's just yeah. sat here. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that's, you know, if I have a cart full of something, inevitably there's like, and it's not really so much men, it's more of women. Like they start looking, say, yeah, why does he have all that? No, that's gotta be a penny. What is that? I mean, yeah. so right. that it's kind of how to navigate all those situations is more of the RA stuff, but yeah, target at Christmas time, I, I've had some trouble for sure. Um, but that's really, mm-hmm. that's really it. A lot of people don't care. We do too. If it's like a smaller store, you know, um, like we'll just ask and you know, like what their maximum purchase policy is, or like if it is online in some capacity. A lot of them have their maximum purchase policy posted online. And, um, if you give me rules, I will follow them. That is totally fine. Like, I don't, I don't want to break anything, you know, or, or upset anybody. So, um, but yeah, I mean, a lot, most people are happy, quite frankly. I mean, a lot of people are thrilled that you're taking away. Mom and, uh, mom and pop stores can be there's one near you, Chris. They just built a new big one at the Belden Village Mall there, a toy store. Um, I've had my go around with that owner there. Um, it's limited me quite severely at this point. But um, 
Yeah. And it's more just funny. Like I was at a, a liquidation kind of store today and they had, you know, like the, the big mouth Billy bass you, you put on the wall and people That's sing thing. like that used to be a thing. Apparently it's still a thing. And they had a whole pile of them for $5. And like, I look them up on eBay and it's like 40 bucks. So I grabbed 10 of them and I go to the register and some other stuff. And the owner, I know who the guy is, he saw me like scanning. And so he goes over and he's got his phone out, right? And he's like looking him up. <laughs> he's looking and I, you know, I don't know why they're only five dollars. Um, uh, they'll catch me, but these are selling so fast. So apparently people still want the the singing bass on the wall, but um yeah. 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 That uh I found one of those and and actually sent one of my daughters screaming out of the room. <laughs> As soon as, as soon as the head turned and started singing, yeah. you know, take me to the river, they're violent. She, she was out of there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of it is, is how do I check out getting the judge the least, right? Yeah. Just get to the car. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever been kicked out of a store by chance? I've not been kicked out. However, I did recently come across, it was, here it is again, Dollar General. Um, you go to enough, you're going to have a real tough one. I had a guy, you know, we do tax exempt almost, you know, everywhere that allows it. Right. And so dollar general issues, a thing from corporate where, uh, and we have one for the different States we go in, but this guy like thought it was like a scam, like Hmm. refused to sell me anything. Um, and actually I wasn't so mad. I did go back the next day because it's very close to our house and I, I've been there a million times. I did talk to the manager like, Hey, like this guy thinks like, this is not, I didn't want someone from like a, a church going in there and, you know, getting like yelled at from this guy. And he was actually there. So that was fun. But, um, yeah, like he refused to sell me anything because he thought like, you'll get people that think they're detectives, right? Like I'm paying all this tax and the man's sticking it to me and look at you, you know, you're a scofflaw or whatever, whatever. And, uh, you know, they, they think they got you, um, when really they, they're just a big reseller themselves. They just don't know it, that, you know, and, uh, but yeah. Yeah. So just, just that one, but not really kicked out, but, uh, no. Okay. Yeah. So there's this lady you guys may know, uh, her name's Sarah and, uh, she wants to know what has been your most entertaining checkout experience. She must have, she must have some some knowledge that we don't. Yeah, it feels like a setup. Yeah, she hears all my stories, right? So she's she's just trying to needle me here. Um, like I said, I run into, and maybe it's my disposition. I don't know. She's she does better than me. Um, yeah, it's know. mostly kind of like I just said. Like you'll get a cashier, especially with the tax exempt stuff, that they really they're a detective, and you are stealing. You know, you are. This is not allowed. How can you not pay tax? And then you explain like, well, you know, okay, all these candy bars right here, right? Like Walmart, they didn't pay sales tax on these. Like you are, Walmart didn't make them. They are reselling them. They did not pay tax on them. Just like, I'm going to resell these things. And like Walmart said, like, I don't have to, the law says I don't have to. So like, here's the card and you know, like, wow, it's, you know, like they just think they're they're the FBI. I don't know. Steve gets a lot of cranky people. (laughs) It's like a weekly thing. I don't know if there's one story that stands out other than a man who gave him a milkshake at checkout. Well, that, that was, was nice. Yeah. But he just, he just, it's constant. He just was it character. Was it like a milkshake that he had half drank and, and like wanted to share? Or was it like a place that, that serves milkshakes? Well, no, a game no. So I mentioned the GameStop sale. I I literally did go to like, 65 ish game stops last year that half off clear so i'm traveling all around right and i'm in this one and there's some lonely game stops and there's some interesting uh quirky employees at those right. game stops and uh, i had just a ton of stuff at this one and um the guy it was about lunchtime and the guy got uh i believe it was burger king actually door dashed and the door dash driver showed up with multiple milkshakes and this guy decided that the second milkshake would be for me and that I had to drink it. And, you know, so I took it out to my car and probably didn't drink any of it. But, um, yeah, he was very nice. Uh, you just, you were, you know, it takes, it takes all kinds, right? It takes mm-hmm. all kinds. And you, you, you never know. If I sit at my computer and do OA, it's just me. I know what I've got. 
you get out there in the world and you never know. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad that you didn't get slipped a Mickey. I, mean, <laughs> I, I wasn't gonna risk it. <laughs> Certainly not gonna break bread with a Legend of Zelda player doing OA, that's for sure. Yes. So uh this is a this is another one from on Twitter. Um so at the, at the the volume that you're you guys are doing, um, what does that corresponding death pile look like? And uh, how do you how do you handle returns and and the death pile in general? Yeah, so I it was kind of bad for a little while, um, and I had said in my mind like I made a goal. All right, by January of twenty twenty three, like we are going to be selling on Walmart. We get where we're selling. I had the account for like two years now we haven't done anything with it like we are all of this stuff right the cpc stuff um all this stuff is, is the brand beauty brand you can't sell right it's all going to walmart yeah so january comes and goes and no i do nothing right so right now it's shockingly very small um we do sell on ebay not really on purpose unless you know it really jumps out at you but um Returns on eBay uh, with so many toys, um, we get you know a lot of toy returns, probably about four percent, five percent. I have a lot of local guys that either have like shops, like toy stores, or they're collectors, or you know I've been active in that space for quite a while. So about once a year, I can text those guys and say, "Hey, like I'll just put all these boxes out at the house, or we've had a garage sale before, um, and we just." you know, blow it out in a day or two, but I just have two shelves now. They're maybe about three feet. And when I get a return, I'll go through it. If I need to open a case for reimbursement, I'll do that. Um, but after that, it just goes on the shelf and then I don't let it get past those two shelves. Like if that's, if those are full and I need to start listing on eBay or whatever. Um, but yeah, I try not to, to let it get past that. Just, you gotta do it every, every week, you know, stay on it. Someone said that they had heard you talk somewhere, uh, about, uh, you know, long-term holds or, or buy and hold strategy. Nah. Uh, and so I'm curious, what do you guys buy and hold? Uh, let yeah, let's do that for this. This one is going to have a couple of follow-ups. So what do you guys buy and hold typically? Almost always toys. So the reason I, I like toys and beauty so much and even into like you know, health stuff, shampoos, whatever, you know, if, if you, and there's nothing wrong with this, right? If you sell cornflakes or dog treats or whatever, like, you know, a box of cornflakes from, you know, 2019 isn't really worth more now, right? It didn't appreciate. It's not a collector's item. You know, if I've got that beauty item and it's discontinued and, you know, Alice and Bonita Springs wants it and she's going to pay a hundred dollars for it when it was 10. Awesome. Right. Same with these toys that are exclusive collectors kind of things, you know, one print, two prints, they're done. They don't get made again. Right. Somebody new starts collecting. Oh, I want one of those. Well, it was 30. Now it's 60. Well, it was 60. Now it's a hundred. So we, we like to stay with stuff that, you know, is going to appreciate just in general, but toys, we will do some beauty, um, as long as the expiration is not an issue and like the buy cost is so good, or we think it's so close to the end of life, like this is it, right? We might only sell a hundred a month, but I'll go ahead and buy a thousand because I don't think I'm ever going to get to, to really buy this, at least at this volume again. So we can stick it away and just kind of slowly leave that inventory out. Uh, but mostly toys. Okay. And, uh, I guess you sort of answered this already, but, uh, if I wanted to go and look for something that I was going to buy and hold or, or be willing to sell over the next, you know, six or 12 months, mm -hmm. what would I look for? How would I figure out if it's close to the end of its life cycle? So on the toy side, I think start with exclusive, right? If it's a store exclusive, um, you know, let's say the Lego set, for example, right? If a Lego set is in every store everywhere, it's in grocery stores, it's at Walmart, Target, Kohl's, ev everybody has a set, right? The distribution is very wide. If it's a Walmart exclusive Lego set, right? It's in theory only at Walmart and Lego stores or Lego shop at home, you know, the online store, whatever. 
Um, so anything where the distribution is narrowed, I'm automatically more interested. Um, and then from there, you know, is it a collector's item, right? Is it part of a major brand, um, a major genre, Star Wars, Harry Potter, or is it, you know, like a powder puff girls Lego, right? Like, I'm, they're, they're not the same thing. So, and then from there, is it collectible? Is it something that kids would buy and adults would buy? You know, what is the range here of people that might want this thing? Um, that's why like Lego city sets, yeah, they'll go up, but largely, you know, it's not the greatest thing to invest in probably. Um, so yeah, I'd say that distribution is, is the first thing I look for. Not always, um, it's scarcity, you know, scarcity and distribution. Okay. How much of your guys's capital do you allocate to these kinds of buys? I try not to. Six months is kind of a sweet spot. Like if I can hold something for six ish months, I'm happy. If it's a little longer, great. I don't really want to go over a year. So that's kind of my target range. Um, it depends on, you know, how far we are from Q4. I also like to sell toys in January, February, you know, s- supply is just so low, which generally means the price is up and, and it's, there's not a lot of competition. Um, right now I would say not a ton, uh, you know. Probably about seventy thousand dollars, you know, by cost of, of inventory right now, and we finally have the space to be able to do it. Yeah, that's since January because we weren't um, doing that as much. Yeah, so Q four is such, especially for it's just such a great magical time of everything sells just so much faster, and I don't think I think all of us don't realize how much more we could sell if you just didn't run out of inventory. Like imagine <laughs> that we just didn't run out so like the last couple of years i all right i want this lego set i'll buy 200 and then i get the buy box on december 8th and the 200 are gone in 36 hours right all right well, what if i had a thousand what if i could get a thousand could i make it a week you know like so that's the that's the thing now is really doing the research trying to figure out the you know 15 products or so that i really like 20 um or sometimes things you just get you know, opportunities are too cheap, right? I'll, I'll buy anything if it's cheap enough, but, um, yeah, yeah. Just trying to do the research and go as deep as I'm comfortable with 70,000 right now, but it'll be probably do- hopefully double that by Q4. I think too, I want to say that it's like, you know, we talk about a couple of things that are just like invaluable, but as far as like looking for like, what would be a good hold, like your own product knowledge that you've accumulated over, you know, for us now, a couple of years of selling. Like, that is just hard to, like, explain to people. It's hard to, like, you know, quantify that. And, um, and uh, yeah, I just think it's, like, if if you know that that's the kind of business you want to have is where you do have these holds, where you're starting to get to that point where you have a little bit of capital, that you're like, okay, like, I can you know, spend some money and tuck some things aside and not sure, like, I could hold on to that. Um, Like, it's still going to take some time because, like, you still test stuff. You still start with smaller. You don't go right into buying holding 200 of a Lego set. Like, you have a year before that where you tried it with only 20, 50, you know, like, and um, and that it's just like a more time consuming grow because you're you're putting so much time, to you know, each each item. But um. Yeah, like just really like niching down and having like strong product knowledge of of a specific thing is really, really valuable. And was there, you talked about, you know, trying 21 year before you're comfortable with 200. Was, was there a certain amount of available capital that you guys think is a good idea for someone to have before they, you know, try to go a little bit deeper on a, a buy and hold strategy? Yeah, I think. I think that's a really yeah. complex answer. Yeah. Right? Like, obviously, I mean, you want to make sure that you your business is healthy enough that it can sustain putting that aside. But if you put that aside, are you going to continue to grow on a week to week, month to month basis? So, you know, like there's just so many factors of like, what do you. It has to be money, either either debt that's 
cheap enough that it doesn't really bother you, right? Or, you know, profits you can take out that doesn't affect, you know, like there's some stores that we like to use cash at, right? I like to always just, I'm not going to say at the house because somebody would be knocking on the door, but, you know, I like to always have cash somewhere secure uh, at my disposal, right? For something comes up, right? A mm-hmm. sale. Um, so I, I want to be able to take it out of the business and not feel like, oh, you know, GameStop's half off clearance tomorrow. Like they just announced it. I, I want to go and be able to spend everything I want to spend and not have to stop. Um, so as long as I can stack some holes and feel like, you know, cash is flowing, everything is healthy, um, you know, just kind of slowly take a little bit of profit off each month and put it into inventory that in theory is going to grow everything larger, right? Once it's sold. And I think too, you, you have to be able to, you know, if something happens, do I have some sort of emergency fund? Do I have some sort of plan? If, you know, something were to go wrong, you get injured, suspended, I don't know. Um, you know, it's what are my liquidation options for the stuff I'm holding? Is there more than one way to liquidate it? Or is Amazon really the only way, you know? So it's nice to have multiple avenues for, for an exit in that way. Perfect. Thank you. Um, you talked about it earlier. You mentioned, you know, not being sure how long that this, uh, FBA is going to be available and, and profitable and, um, do you have any insight on, on what changes you, you think are coming in the near future for RA and the Amazon landscape as a whole? And, uh, if so, what are you, uh, what are you doing to, uh, in response to that? Yeah. I, and I think we would both say this. I, I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Um, I, I think it's very solidly here. I think it's here to stay. There's some interesting data that came out recently about units from third party sellers based on you know, first party, third party continues to grow and now pays first party, uh, more and more every year, you know, Amazon is a marketplace, right? It's, it's a marketplace for third party sellers. Um, I, you know, we treat it, I treat it like a sprint. Um, we're not that old. Uh, I like to work, we're doing well. So, you know, the more I can do now when I know it's good, right? No, but I'm, I'm fairly certain tomorrow is going to be okay. And the next day and the next day in the near future, you know, we can really sprint here in the next handful of years, like we've been doing the first few years and not go crazy, right? Still be able to focus on family and things like that within reason. Um, you know, why not? And, and try to meet some financial goals and then see what you want to do five years from now. But I, I don't think it's going away. Um, changes. You know, I think the biggest change recently is ease of ungating. Uh, you know, three years ago, if you were a newbie, you were selling a used book or a bra from Kohl's, you know, now the newbies are selling socks from Nike and Lululemon belt bags, right? Cause you can get ungated. And I joked about the picture of a dog, but like, seriously, it's, it's almost that easy at, at, at this point. Um, but I think that's a response to inflation, right? I think Amazon looked and said, Hey, you know, how can we not have our customers feel this as much as maybe some other places. And if you let everybody get ungated and there's more competition, right? Price comes down. So ease of ungating has really been the biggest change recently. And I don't know if people talk about that enough because it, it's totally changed everything in my opinion. Um, well, what do you think about the future and where things know. are headed? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the way we see it today, I, I have no idea. Um, but as far as like arbitrage, I mean, it, yeah. it probably is going to exist, I think, in some capacity. Um, it's just hard. Like I think of, I think of a little over three years ago, January 2020, and what I thought then and just like how vastly different I think of everything now. And I like I I couldn't even begin to predict like what we're what we're, what we're gonna be doing what everything's like I couldn't even I don't know I just like he said like it's great it's good keep going to, you know make as much as you can enjoy it while it's here and like I don't know I just along for the ride sometimes it feels like but at, like in a good way though I, don't know. Mm-hmm. I think for a response yeah. and I know a lot of people talk about building a moat and all of that and and I agree with that that's certainly a thing. Um, I think you need to be an expert in something, 
anything, whether it's a brand, whether it's five brands, whether it's a category, you know, you really have to, like for me, it's toys. Like I'll join Facebook toy groups, not because I'm a collector, I don't collect anything, but I want to see what the collectors are talking about. Or like she'll join Facebook mommy groups because they'll go, hey, uh, can anybody find this? I can't find it anywhere. And like, boom, like that's a bolo, right? Like the answers are out there. For beauty, it's a lot of like YouTube. Like you have all the beauty gurus on YouTube that are, they'll hypothesize that this is being discontinued because of all these factors, but you know. um, Yeah, just be an expert in solving anything. And TikTok, and didn't, uh, didn't somebody get caught smuggling free roll-ups because of TikTok? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, it, and yeah. Israel. <laughs> yeah. If we can get something viral on TikTok, it'll sell. Great. Let the universe speak to you. <laughs> right. So I'm curious, you know, because you guys talk about that and I know you guys brought Dave Ramsey up a little bit earlier. Uh, do outside of Amazon, if you don't mind sharing, what do you do with your money? Are you... ETFs? Are you index funds? Are you going to buy real estate? Like what is your, your outside of Amazon plan? Um, so thus far it's been all index funds. Um, we actually just, so like this all started for us in 2018. Um, that was when we had like a lot of debt still, and not even a lot. I mean, we didn't even have a lot, but that was when we had debt and like, you know, our money was a lot tighter. And then 2020 was when, you know, the whole Amazon thing started. So, um, 2021, once we had made a little bit of money, like that's when I first opened a Roth IRA. Um, like I didn't even have one before that. I didn't have any, you know, so like we are still in some ways, it feels like beginners. Now we've been able to put a lot into those accounts in the last couple of years, but the accounts are still pretty new. Um, so yeah, that's, it's kind of been like the simple route, just doing that so far. I think long-term, I do think we want to do a little bit with real estate. Um, but we, you know, we got the new house and I think that it's going to just take us maybe a couple of years before we get to where we feel comfortable investing. That. So, um, and I just, I also just have a lot to learn there. P- part of the investing strategy is inventory. Um, yeah, that's true. You know, we, we've, you know, we talked about some of those holds like that is literally an investment, um, you know, and it's not, you know, five years ago, whatever the article mm-hmm. Legos better than gold and all that stuff, you know, I, not quite that it, it's a little more difficult now for sure. Uh, but there's stuff out there that, you know, you can put your money into if you know what you're doing in, in certain niches and, and really, you know, look up six months, a year from now and go, wow, I wish I had, you know, way more of those things. Um, but yeah, we have a financial planner we work with and the CPA and, you know, she's big and I, I love this. Yeah. <laughs> I wake up and work every day. She takes care of like all of that. So I think too, just realistically speaking, like when you're self-employed, a part of it just comes down to like, where can I put my money so that I pay the least in taxes? You just tell me like what strategy that should be and like how I should divvy it up. And I think that like that is a a significant factor for us right now is just like we don't need it we're okay we're living just fine so like where can we put it to pay the least in taxes that we can pay absolutely one of the things that we always like to ask folks is is there is there anything that we didn't ask you that we should have or or something that you get asked quite often uh, that maybe we didn't think of. So, I mean, by far the, the most asked question I get is just how did you scale so fast? Mm -hmm. Um, and just for like super quick background, like we hit our first hundred thousand in 97 days after starting Amazon. Um, and we hit our first million like a couple days after our one year anniversary. It was like 368 days or something like that. So we did scale super fast. Um, and my answer to that, and it, it sounds cliche, but it, it is what it is, is just like the small, tiny steps, like every single day, just doing absolutely anything 
to take a step. Like it doesn't have to be big. We have little kids. Like my time is super divine. I cannot do a lot. I can't do like little tiny things. Um, and I think also just the power of like taking those steps and being prepared. So if an opportunity hits, you're already ready. Um, people love to talk about, people tell me all the time how lucky I was to, that when COVID hit, like I had Amazon, but I, I started Amazon the month before when I had no idea that that was going to happen. I had already, it, the wheels were already turning when the opportunity hit. And so I think some of it is just like, like getting the wheels turning so that, you know, if something opens up, you're actually ready to take advantage of it. You're not like trying to fumble to, to catch up. In, uh, one of my favorite podcasters calls that, uh, increasing the surface area for serendipity. You know, I, yeah. that's one of Yeah. I love that. I don't know. What do you get asked over? I mean, I don't nah. get asked a lot of questions of maybe I could, I think my only thing I would say is just like, just being prepared, right? Like, especially for RA, like make sure if I'm going into a store, ask, Hey, do you do tax exam? Is that an option? What are, you know, like people like, how do you remember all the items? The little Slack remembers. I don't have to, you know, I always have all my forms. Like I have multiple copies of everything I need. Like I never, I never go into a store unprepared or I'm going to leave money on the table because I don't know something, right? I'm going to talk to a manager, ask, be friendly. Like they're just there doing their job. They want to talk to somebody too. And you know, like it's make connections, right? If you can connect with people, um, the ROI on that, I've never, you know, tried to network or had it and like, oh, that, that was terrible. In some way it's always worked. So, you know, network, put yourself out there. Okay. Um, so I, I think that's, uh, did we finally get through the, the list of questions? Chris? That that's it. Yeah. yeah. That yeah, was, that, that had to be one of the longest lists that we, that we've <laughs> I, I think so. The, I mean, the only thing we do need to to do is you know, if, if people want to go follow you or find you guys on social media, uh, or, and I know that you guys have like a group, where can people go to find out about all the things that Steve and Alexa, you know, might have to offer, uh, both free and paid. Okay. So it is our social media accounts. So I'm on Instagram. It is the, at the other dot Alexa. Um, and we have all the information about the village in there, um, as well as anything else that we offer up in my links and his, your Twitter. Yeah, my Twitter is at the village underscore A M Z. So, and all the Perfect. same stuff, Lake tree and you know, all that you can check out anything we have going on. Perfect. And that'll all be down in the show notes. So you guys don't have to remember that. Of course, there'll be links to everyone's social media and, uh, and things like that. So you can go find them. Uh, I know that I am in the villages. I don't spend a yes. whole lot of time in there as, uh, as I would like to, uh, but I, everything I see, everything is fantastic that you guys put together. So, um, we do, we do try to end the show every week with, uh, with a quote of the week and, and we, we tossed a couple around, uh, but I think this one does, does fit. Um, yeah, this one's from Oscar Wilde. Uh, it's everything popular is wrong. And that seems to be kind of very on the nose and very matter of fact, but I really think based on kind of the way Oscar Wilde was, I think that, uh, uh, really is just to kind of say, maybe we should question things, uh, as they come at us, because I think you guys broke down a lot of, um, a lot of things people think they need to have, you know, they need to have this perfect SOP and they need to have this perfect process to be able to grow a business that. Uh, that others might even be envious of, uh, and not necessarily the case, you know, you guys are doing it your way. Uh, and, and that's, I don't know, that's what I love about Amazon. And, you know, we all kind of get to tailor the way that we want to do things to fit our lifestyles. Uh, so I think that's great guys. I really appreciate you hanging out with us. This was a, a longer than usual episode and, and Chris and I typically go long anyway. That's saying uh, something. Yeah. So uh, I think this was fantastic. Thank you so much for, for hanging out with us. Yeah. Thank you guys yeah. for having us. Thank you very much. It was great. Absolutely.
All right. Uh, that's the pod, guys. Uh, I will see you guys, or we will see you guys next week. Okay. Thanks for listening to Clear the Shelf with Chris and Chris. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a screenshot on your phone and share to Facebook, Instagram, or your favorite FBA group. And be sure to tag me and let me know why you liked it and what you'd like to hear more from us in the future. Also, I'd like to give you some free gifts for listening. Head over to rabbittrailchallenge.com and repricerchallenge.com for some free courses to further your business. Thanks for listening.